Hello, welcome to Health 125, Survey of Medical Terminology. This is Lecture 13, The Special Senses. Before we can talk about the structure of the eye and ear, we should note that these are these special senses, that is, senses like taste, smell, vision, hearing, and balance, that are located exclusively in the head. In contrast, the general senses are located all over the body, and they consist of senses such as pain, temperature, light touch, deep touch, pressure, and senses of body position called proprioception. The first sense we're going to look at is hearing, and hearing is a special sense that is located only in the head, and the, and the ear is divided into three different parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The parts of the outer ear include the auricle. The auricle is otherwise known as the earlobe or pinna, and the function of the auricle is to funnel sound into the ear canal. The ear canal, sometimes called the external auditory canal, channels sound into the middle ear. The external auditory canal is a place where you would insert a Q-tip, although you're always told not to put Q-tips in the ear, but this is a site where earwax may accumulate. The earwax is produced by ceraminous glands within the external auditory canal. The tympanic membrane, or ear drum, separates the outer ear from the middle ear. The tympanic membrane is a very thin piece of tissue that vibrates as sound waves pass through the auditory canal towards the middle ear. As that tympanic membrane vibrates, it will then push on bones within the middle ear. The bones in the middle ear are called the middle ear ossicles, and there are three different ossicles. They are called the incus, the malleus, and the stapes. The incus, malleus, and stapes work together to transmit vibrations of the tympanic membrane onto the oval window of the cochlea, which is part of the inner ear. The eustachian tube is a tube that helps equalize pressure between the middle ear and the air in the pharynx. The eustachian tube will exit into the pharynx by small holes in the back of the throat, and this allows equalization of air pressure. If you've ever driven over the poly or maybe a high mountain and felt your ears pop, that's because the pressure in the middle ear is different than the pressure outside. This pressure will eventually equalize by movement of air from the eustachian tube into the pharynx. Uh, sometimes if your ears are plugged up, the eustachian tube cannot equalize this pressure, resulting in some quite excruciating pain. The next region of the ear is the inner ear. The inner ear is where the cochlea is housed. The cochlea is the organ in the ear that is responsible for transducing the vibrations into nerve impulses. Remember that nerve impulses are really the only language that the brain understands. The brain does not understand sound vibrations, but it can interpret nerve impulses as sound. So the job of the cochlea is to convert these vibrations into nerve impulses. Above the cochlea are the semicircular canals. These are fluid-filled canals that are not used in hearing, but are instead used in balance and orientation. So they help you understand whether or not you're upright, upside down, and whether you're moving or standing still. We'll talk more about them in just a second. Now that we've learned the parts of the ear, let's take a look at how sound is transmitted through the ear. As we said before, the purpose of the auricle or pinna is to funnel sound into the auditory canal. Once the sound moves through the auditory canal, it will bump up against our tympanic membrane. Remember, the tympanic membrane is a very thin uh, tissue membrane that will vibrate as the sound waves hit it. When the tympanic membrane vibrates, it will in turn vibrate the ossicles of the middle ear, that is, our incus, malleus, and stapes. And these will push against the oval window, which leads into the vestibular duct. As sound waves move through the fluid-filled vestibular duct of the cochlea, they will push into the cochlear duct, causing a deformation in the basilar membrane. As the basilar membrane is deformed, it will touch against or mash up against hair cells, which are responsible for transducing that sound wave into a series of nerve impulses. Because the cochlea is fluid-filled, there's really no way to dissipate these sound waves other than to let them pass back out through a bulge uh, at the bottom of the cochlea called the round window. So every time the stapes pushes against the oval window, it will send vibrations running through the fluid of the vestibular duct, and these will eventually be transmitted out of the ear through the tympanic duct and cause a bulging outwards of the oval window. If you have any type of ear damage, it's possible to damage the tympanic membrane, as we said previously, and it's also possible to damage or rupture either the oval window or the round window. Oval window and round window ruptures are much more serious than a rupture of the tympanic membrane because these are in the organ of transduction, the cochlea. Remember, the function of the cochlea is to convert these sound vibrations into a series of nerve impulses that can be perceived by the brain. So the cochlea is the organ of sound transduction. It helps to convert sound waves into a pattern of nerve impulses that the brain can understand. Connected to the cochlea are organs of balance and orientation. These consist of the saccule, the utricle, and also the semicircular canals. Together, these organs help sense balance, rotation, acceleration, and also deceleration. You should note that the semicircular canals are vertical, horizontal, and also oblique. So these help us sense uh, dynamic equilibrium, such as movement. 
If you're moving in a very swift moving car, you know that you're moving because of the fluid is moving through your semicircular canals. The way that the semicircular canals and otolithic organs, the saccule and the utricle, work is fairly complicated, and you'll learn more about how these organs work in your anatomy and physiology classes. But suffice it to say, all of these organs participate in equilibrium, that is, maintaining balance. Both the organs of equilibrium and the cochlea communicate with the brain via a nerve called the vestibulocochlear nerve. The auditory nerve is the branch that carries nerve impulses from the cochlea, whereas the vestibular nerve is the branch that carries nerve impulses from the vestibular apparatus, the saccule, the utricle, and the semicircular canals. There are two words that mean pertaining to the ear. The first is the word prefix oto, which means ear. An example of a word using oto would be otoscope. An otoscope is a device used to look into the auditory canal and visualize the tympanic membrane. If you go in for a routine checkup, chances are the physician will look into your ear with an otoscope to make sure that the tympanic membrane is intact and that there's no fluid buildup behind the tympanic membrane. Another word meaning pertaining to the ear is oral. Oral is more used in the veterinary industry, as in the term oral hematomas. Oral hematomas are collections of blood within the external ear of a dog. Audiometry is a type of clinical test used to evaluate the hearing of a patient or subject. Remember, audio is a combining form, meaning to hear, and metry is a suffix, which means measurement. So what we have is something that means measurement of hearing. Typically during audiometry, we have somebody sitting in a soundproof booth. They're wearing high-quality stereo earphones, and the physician will send sounds into the speakers that they're wearing on their head of varying uh, decibel levels, that is varying magnitude, and also of varying frequency. What they're trying to find out is what is the minimum decibel level that a person can hear at each frequency within both the left and right ears. The result of her audiometry study will be published in an audiogram or audiograph. The audiogram is just a standard way of representing a person's hearing loss throughout the frequency range that most people can hear in. That is, we're typically looking at 100 hertz to 8,000 hertz. The lower the hertz levels indicates lower sounds, that is, deeper sounds, whereas the higher hertz levels indicate higher sounds. So 100 hertz to 8,000 hertz is typically the range needed for clear understanding of speech. So if somebody has hearing loss in that frequency, uh, we might have to prescribe some kind of hearing aid for that person, depending on the amount of hearing loss they're experiencing. Now let's take a look at some diseases and conditions affecting the ear. The first of these is Meniere's disease. This is a disease of the inner ear which causes recurring bouts of vertigo, tinnitus, and nausea. You probably already know what nausea is, it's sickness to your stomach. Uh, vertigo is a loss of balance or dizziness, and we'll talk about tinnitus in a future slide. Uh, Meniere's disease is idiopathic, oftentimes we don't know what causes it, but we think it might be caused by an excess fluid buildup within the inner ear. And this causes some conflicting uh, signal to the central nervous system about the patient's orientation, their movement, their balance. And so what happens, we can often have a person that staggers about, uh, has a hard time standing on their feet, and probably should not be operating any type of heavy machinery or driving while they're having an attack. Uh, there are some limited treatments available for people with Meniere's disease. And these include wicks that are inserted uh, into the inner ear that wick excess fluid away into the middle ear, where it can be evacuated through the station tube. Another disease of the ear is something called otomycosis. Remember, oto means ear, and mycosis refers to fungus. So this is a fungal infection of the ear. Uh, otomycosis can be caused by poor hygiene, or it can also be caused by depressed immune systems. Uh, otomycosis can lead to a lot of itching within the ear, can be very uncomfortable, and this is something that we also see in cats and dogs, fungus or yeast within the ear. Another hearing disorder that is not so much a disease, but a symptom of several diseases, is tinnitus. Tinnitus is a chronic or periodic ringing in the ears, and it's usually caused by overexposure to very loud sounds, for example, if you've been in a rock concert uh, the night before, uh, or if you operate a jackhammer, but it can also be caused by pressure damage to the inner ear. Finally, some medications, particularly some anti-malarial agents or antibiotics, are ototoxic and can cause death of hair cells within the ear, resulting in tinnitus. Now we're going to switch over and take a look at the anatomy of the eye. The eye is composed of three different tissue layers. The outer tissue layer is called the external tunic of the eye. Tunic just means covering or shirt. And this tunic is divided into two parts. The first part is the cornea. The cornea is the very clear lens-like structure on the outside of the eye. If you put contacts on, you wear them directly over your cornea. So the cornea is a clear tissue which lets light penetrate into the eye. And it's partially responsible for the refractive ability of the eye. Refraction is the ability for the eye to bend light. Now we said the cornea was the first part of the external tunic or fibrous tunic. The sclera is the second part. The sclera is the outside white part of the eye. You cannot see through the sclera. It is opaque, made of white fibrous connective tissue. And it's a very rigid tissue which helps to hold the shape of the eye and the pressure of the eye. So as light passes through the cornea, it will first pass through a fluid called aqueous humor. Remember, humor means fluid, so this is a very non-viscous fluid, a watery-like fluid, that sits in the anterior chamber of the eye. 
just behind the aqueous humor is the iris. The function of the iris is to adjust the amount of light coming into the eye. You have probably seen an iris on a microscope or on a high quality uh, camera lens. Uh, the iris helps restrict or increase the amount of light coming in and we typically adjust the iris to very wide open in very very dark uh, conditions. For example if you walk into a dark movie theater your iris will open up opening up the size of your pupil. On the other hand, if you walk out into bright sunlight, your iris will reflexively constrict, v further reducing the amount of light that's passing into the eye. And so this is when you get very, very narrow pinpoint pupils. The iris is smooth muscle, so it's not voluntarily controlled. The pupil is just the hole through which light passes through the iris. Uh, again, the pupil size is determined by uh, reflexive contraction of the iris, so you can't control it voluntarily, but the pupil size is something we use to evaluate um, sometimes somebody's medical condition. Uh, usually, if you shine a light in somebody's eyes, the pupils will constrict, uh, and this will reduce the amount of light going into the eye. On the other hand, if you shine a light into somebody's eyes and the pupils aren't constricting, that can mean one of two things. Uh, one, they might have some kind of brain damage, or more likely, if they're sitting up talking to you, they have probably imbibed some recreational drugs or alcohol. Just behind the pupil is the lens. The lens is the second refractive part of the eye. Remember we said refraction means the ability to bend light, and the cornea was the first refractive structure in the visual path. The lens is the second refractive structure. The lens is actually adjustable where the cornea is not. So depending on whether you're looking at something very close to you or very far away, the shape of the lens can be adjusted by pulling of special muscle tissue on either side of the lens. So the lens is somewhat pliable. The function of the lens is to focus light onto the retina. The retina is the area where light will be transduced or converted into a pattern of nerve impulses. Behind the lens is a posterior chamber where the vitreous humor or vitreous body is housed. The purpose of the vitreous body is to maintain the pressure and rigidity of the eye. Uh, the vitreous humor is vitreous or viscous. Uh, if you've ever dissected a sheep eye in your anatomy class, you know that the vitreous body sort of looks like a big thick glob of very clear snot. And the purpose is to hold the round structure of the eye. So as light passes through the pupil, it will pass through the lens and be focused and should pass unimpeded through the vitreous body of the eye. In back of the vitreous body is a second eye layer called the retina. The retina is a very thin layer called the neural layer where, tran where transduction occurs. Transduction is the conversion of light into nerve impulses. Remember, your brain doesn't really understand light, but it does understand patterns of nerve impulses. So the retina has special photoreceptors on there called rods and cones, which help to convert the light coming into the eye into a pattern of nerve impulses. In back of the retina is the choroid. The choroid is the vascular layer of the eye. Remember, vascular means vessel, so this is where we have a lot of blood vessels. The eye is a very energetically expensive organ. It needs a lot of glucose, and it also needs a lot of oxygen. So we have lots of blood vessels in the choroid, which will supply the retina and other structures within the eye. Finally, the back of the eye is where the optic nerve is located. The optic nerve carries nerve impulses from the retina to the brain. Probably at some point in your lifetime, when you went to the doctor's office, they would look into your eye with the ophthalmoscope. The ophthalmoscope is an instrument used to visualize structures deep within the eye. So they can take a look at the opacity or translucency of the vitreous body and also the lens, and they can also evaluate the health of the retina. Remember, the retina was the area where light transduction occurs. Uh, here in this image, you can see some blood vessels uh, running through the retina. That's not actually in the retina itself, but in the back of the retina in the choroid. The retina itself is semi-transparent and sits over top of the choroid. And there's two structures we should point out here. The first of these is the macula. That's on the right side of your screen. And this is an area of very intense uh, photoreceptor density. So if you're looking straight at somebody, you're typically pointing your macula uh, right at them so that light bouncing off their body or off their face will hit the macula, which contains the greatest density of photoreceptors, specifically cones. Cones are photoreceptors that help to sense color vision. Now, while we're on the subject of the macula, uh, be sure to read page 552 in your textbook, which describes macular degeneration. A macular degeneration is an incurable disease and probably one of the most common causes of blindness in older adults. On the other hand, the blind spot, which is located to the left of the macula in this picture, is the area where the optic nerve exits the eye. You can't actually see at your blind spot, that is, you don't have any photoreceptors there, but your brain just fills in around it. If you go on the internet and look for blind spot tests, you can see some pretty simple but pretty cool tests that show that, yes, there is in fact a blind spot in the eye. This slide shows a cross-section through the retina. Remember, the function of the retina is to convert a light into a series of nerve impulses that can be perceived by the brain. So as light passes through the eye, it will reach the retina, and it will pass through a series of cell layers, a ganglionic cell layer, a bipolar cell layer, and then finally a layer of cells where our photoreceptors are located. These are going to be our rods and cones. 
in back of the retina is a structure called the choroid, and the choroid is there to provide blood to the retina, and it's also pigmented to prevent any bounce back of light back through the retina a second time. In back of the choroid is the sclera. The sclera is the fibrous connective tissue that surrounds the outside of the eye and holds the eye rigid and turgid. Now I think I mentioned previously that we have two different types of photoreceptors, rods and cones. Cones are responsible for transducing very low light levels. Uh, they don't see in color, they transduce sort of black and white vision, and they're most active in very dim or low light levels. So think about when you wake up in the morning before it's very light, you're looking around your bedroom and looking at uh, the shapes of things in your bedroom, and you're going to see your dresser and your alarm clock and things like that, and typically you're going to be seeing in shades of gray. You may also notice that the edges of things aren't very sharp. Things tend to look fuzzy at very dim or low light levels. That's because rods don't have nearly the acuity or sharpness that cones do, but they do get by in a lot lower light levels. Cones, on the other hand, need a lot of light to operate. Cones transduce information about color vision. So if you walk outside on a sunny Hawaii day and you see the bright colors out there, that's going to be because your cones are becoming more and more active. As we said previously, your cones are most concentrated in the macula, or focal spot, of your retina, whereas your rods are most dense uh, at areas away from the macula. Now let's take a look at some diseases and surgical procedures of the eye. Uh, the first of these is a cataract. A cataract is a growing opacity of the crystalline structure of the lens, and it will reduce the ability, uh, reduce the amount of light coming into the eye, and reduce the ability of somebody with cataracts to read a stop sign, or to read a book, or even to drive in traffic. Um, so one of the ways we can treat cataracts is to actually remove the lens and replace it. We now have very good replacement lens, which can be um, inserted into the eye. We simply draw out the old lens through an incision in the cornea, and then we insert the new lens, which uh, has little plastic hooks, which will grab onto the ciliary muscles, which are used to focus the eye. Another very common but very serious disease of the eye is glaucoma. Glaucoma is caused by an increased intraocular pressure. This is caused by an accumulation of aqueous humor in the anterior chamber of the eye. Uh, if this fluid accumulates without being drained, it can lead to a greater and greater pressure in the eye, and this pressure can cause degeneration of the retina and also of the optic nerve. And this is going to result in progressive vision loss and eventually blindness. The thing about certain types of glaucoma is they are not acute. They are chronic, and they tend to happen very, very slowly so that people don't realize until they've lost a significant portion of their vision that their vision is being affected. Your book goes into detail talking about the different causes of glaucoma or whether the glaucoma is open angle or closed an angle, and you'll learn more about this in your anatomy and physiology class. Now I should point out two different word parts that pertain to the eye. Uh, the word part blepher means pertaining to the eyelids, so blepharitis is an inflammation of the eyelids. On the other hand, conjunct refers to the tissue surrounding the eye and also adherent to the eye, the conjunctiva. So conjunctivitis would be an inflammation of the conjunctiva surrounding the eye. So that would be the red stuff around the eye and also going onto the surface of the eye. That's the conjunctiva. We're going to take a look at two diseases that affect the eyelid and eyelashes, and these are entropion and ectropion. Uh, entropion is an inward curling of the eyelid and eyelashes. If you've ever gotten a single eyelash in your eye, you know how painful and aggravating it can be. So imagine if your whole eyelid and eyelashes had turned in and were touching the sclera and cornea of your eye. This is going to lead to immense pain and also some conjunctivitis, some inflammation of the conjunctiva. Uh, if left untreated, it can lead to permanent damage to the cornea and also the sclera of the eye. Uh, typical treatment for entropion is surgical correction. We're going to cut that eyelid and rotate it outward to where the eyelashes are no longer touching the eye. The opposite of entropion is actropion. That is an outward rotation of the eyelid. Uh, as a result of it, we have the eyelashes are well outside the eye, and also we're exposing some of the underlying tissue, uh, which can be very, very sensitive. So entropion and ectropion are both usually going to be surgically corrected. We get these in humans as well as in our four-legged friends, cats and dogs. Another condition affecting the eye is astigmatism. And astigmatism is a defect in the refractive powers of the eye. Remember, refraction is the bending of light, and the two structures responsible for bending light are the cornea and also the lens. Irregularities in the shape of the cornea or the lens can cause light not to be bent correctly. Normally, in a correctly shaped lens and cornea, light will be focused onto a single spot in the retina, usually the macula. On the other hand, if we have a misshapen lens or a misshapen cornea, that light will be spread diffusely onto the retina, causing some problems with vision. There are different ways to correct for astigmatism. There are certainly corrective lenses, whether you're talking about glasses or even contact lenses. This slide shows an example of what an uncorrected astigmatism would look like. And the picture at left is a picture with, uh, viewed with a normal lens under normal focus, and the picture at right shows the results of a lens that is misshapen or a cornea that is misshapen. It leads to some blurriness in the visual field. One way that we diagnose astigmatism is to give somebody an astigmatism test. 
Uh, this is up at the top of the screen. You can see a series of lines are radiating out from a circle. If you look at this and one of the lines looks thicker than the other ones, chances are you may have an astigmatism. All these lines are in fact the same width. Two other very common defects which affect the refractive ability of the eye are myopia and presbyopia. Myopia is nearsightedness. If you're in a crowd and you can see things very clear that are near to you, but things that are further away are very fuzzy or blurry, indicates that you have myopia. This is the most common type of visual defect. If you have myopia, chances are you're going to wear some kind of corrected lenses. On the other hand, presbyopia is the ability to see things clearly that are further away from you, but not so clearly if they're close up to you. So this is farsightedness. Uh, presbyopia uh, literally means old vision. So people that have presbyopia uh, typically have to hold a newspaper or a book uh, further away than a normal person would in order for them to focus clearly on the words on the page. Presbyopia tends to be more common in older people, and what happens is that the lens loses some of its uh, elasticity and therefore cannot be adjusted to focus on very, very close items. If you take a look at a child and how they might read a book, they can put that book just a few inches from their face and focus on the words correctly. But as you get older, that lens elasticity goes down and you have to hold that book or newspaper further and further away from your face in order to focus on the words clearly. Another word for presbyopia is hyperopia. Uh, both myopia and presbyopia are typically treated with corrective lenses. One way that we can test visual acuity is by giving somebody a Snellen eye test. Uh, the Snellen eye test is basically uses a chart which contains letters of different sizes, and as you go down to the chart, the letters get smaller and smaller and smaller. Typically, the subject will stand or sit about 20 feet away from the eye chart and cover one eye. They will look through the exposed eye and try to read as far down in the chart as their eyes can resolve. For example, if you were able to read down to row number 8, that would indicate that you have 20-20 vision. That is, you can read at 20 feet what most people can read at 20 feet. If you could read all the way down to the bottom row, row 9, you would have 20-15 vision. That is, you could resolve letters at 20 feet that most people would have to be 15 feet away. So this would be better than normal vision. Another type of visual disorder is red-green color blindness. Red-green color blindness is typically a disorder that is genetically inherited. It is much more common in males than it is in females. So if you look at this picture and you can see the green 27 in the center, that means you have normal color vision. On the other hand, people with red-green color blindness would not be able to see the 2 and 7 in the middle of the red circle, and they would have red-green color blindness. Now, you can drive a car with red-green color blindness, and there's no way to really correct for it, but it would preclude you from participating in some sorts of activities. You cannot fly a jet plane, at least for the military, if you have red-green color blindness. Another type of test used to evaluate the eye is tonometry. Tonometry looks at the pressure in the eye, that is the intraocular pressure, and intraocular pressure is caused by accumulation of fluid within the eye. Specifically, we're talking about fluid within the anterior chamber, that is the aqueous humor. Uh, we, we're very concerned about people that have high pressure within the eye because this can lead to degeneration of the optic nerve and retina. Previously, we looked at the disorder of glaucoma, which is most often caused by higher than normal intraocular pressure. So to measure intraocular pressure, uh, we can use several different types of devices called tonometers. Uh, up top, you see a mechanical tonometer we're using on a dog. And it has a series of weights and a pressure sensor that's applied directly to that dog's cornea to measure the intraocular pressure. More often in human medicine, you'll probably be using a digital tonometer or tonopen. At the bottom of the screen, you can see a picture of a woman who has a tonopen pen applied to her cornea that's going to be used to measure the interocular pressure. Typically when you go to an eye doctor they will have a little blue looking stem that they extend directly onto the surface of your eye and this is even a more accurate way to measure interocular pressure. If somebody's found to have a higher than normal interocular pressure we can give them a series of different drugs which will help to reduce the interocular pressure and reduce the chances that they will come down with glaucoma. Another test we might use to evaluate the eye is the Schirmer tear test. The Schirmer tear test is used to evaluate the lacrimation or tear production of the eye. There are certain disorders where we might have a lower than normal tear production. One of these is KCS, keratoconjunctivitis sica, and this is caused by lower than normal production of tears. To diagnose KCS, we will apply one of the Schirmer tear test strips underneath one of the eyelids, and we typically do both eyes at one time. And what happens is that the uh, tear strip will aggravate the eye a little bit and induce it to lacrimate or produce tears. And as the tears are produced, they will be wicked up the surface of the strip, and the strip has a blue dye that will travel along with the tears. And typically after one minute, you should get, you know, somewhere in the range of 25 millimeters or so. That's for a normal eye. If it's less than that, you might suspect KCS or other diseases which affect the lacrimation or tear production within the eye. And we use this test both in the human medicine field and also in the veterinary medicine fields, because KCS and similar disorders are present both in dogs and also in people as well.